started shortly, so just hang in with us and um, we'll get started soon.
Can everybody hear me okay? A little louder? Okay. How does this sound now? Still a little louder? Well, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Does this, does this sound like a good volume? Welcome. Um, thank you guys for coming out on this rainy spring night. My name is Laura Klein. I'm a third year uh, PhD student in the Comparative Lactation Lab here in the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology. And I'm excited to talk to you tonight about uh, how milk is more than food and how we can think, of, uh, think about some of the applications for using the immune molecules in milk as medicine. So as we get started tonight, the first thing I'd like you to do is just take a minute and think about milk. What comes to mind? Maybe that you should really pick up a gallon on your way home because otherwise you'll have nothing to put on your breakfast cereal. Or if you're enjoying some of the chocolate chip cookies that we have here tonight that you really wish we had a glass of milk to enjoy them with. We're really familiar with this idea of milk as food. And archaeological evidence tells us that the first time that um, animals were domesticated for milk was over 5,000 years ago. And so we've had a lot of time in our cultures to get used to the idea of milk as food. And not only do we enjoy it as a beverage, but also as cheeses, yogurts, ice creams. Sorry. Um, and tonight, we're going to step outside of our familiar familiarity with milk as food and start to think about milk as part of what makes us mammals. And we'll look at how our unique ability to produce a special substance called milk as the first food for our young does more than just uh, provide food. I'm really sorry. What you're seeing here is not what I'm seeing. Oh, I think it's not presenting. Can you need to be in presenter mode. Um, it's not switching slides. Oh, there. Our apologies. There we go. Okay. The arrows. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. No. Okay. Um, but this. So we're going to look at milk as more than food. Um, so tonight, we'll first be starting with the recipe for milk um, and what's in milk. So the second part of our talk, we'll dive a little bit deeper into what makes milk more than food and how we can understand how the immune molecules in milk help support uh, the infant's developing immune system. And finally, we'll talk about some new directions and questions in milk research and applications for milk as medicine. So as I said, all mammals make milk. Um, and what's in milk tends to be the same uh, across all species. There's water, fats, sugars like lactose, proteins, vitamins like vitamin C and D, and minerals like calcium. But the exact recipe for milk among species can vary greatly. But why might you want to change the recipe for milk? Well, what works as a good food for infants in an arid environment like a desert might not be the best food for them in a colder climate like a tundra. And what works as uh, milk for a species like an elephant 
might not be the same that works for species like a mouse. So when we look at human milk, we can see that it's mostly water with a little bit of fat and protein and sugars. Now, surprisingly, this looks very similar to zebra milk. <laughs> but species can actually have very similar looking milk for very different reasons. So zebras live in a hot, dry environment. So they need, uh, they've been adapted to be able to uh, supply their young with a lot of water. But other animals that tend to lactate for a long time and support their infants with milk for months or even years also tend to have very dilute milks. And that's the pattern that we see in humans. But I don't want you to get fooled in thinking that milk is the, uh, the the recipe for milk is the same among species because I've shown you two very different species that happen to look alike. We can also look at something like the hooded seal. Now hooded seals live in the Arctic Circle where it's very, very cold. And they give birth on really unstable ice flows. So they may only have up to four days to nurse their pups. And so they have very high content, uh, high fat milk, high con high fatty milk. And with this milk, they can, trans they can transfer up to 15 pounds of fat a day to help their infants grow the blubber layers that they need to help protect them from the cold Arctic temperatures. But species that are closely related can also have very different milk. So most rodents, um, of which mice are one species, tend to have milk that's lower in water, than human milk and higher in fats and proteins and sugars. But naked mole rats, which are also a rodent, have very different milk composition. They have very high water content because like the zebras, they live in a very arid, dry, hot environment where they can lose a lot of water through their skin. So they also have very high water content milk in order to be able to hydrate their young. But no matter the recipe for milk, milk is capable of meeting all of an infant's nutritional needs. But milk is more than just food for infants. Now, first we should step back and say, why do we eat food? Does anyone want to tell me one reason why we eat food? Survive. To survive. Okay. Energy, exactly. Why else? Taste. Taste. Food tastes good. Exactly, building blocks. So food provides us with the energy we need to do things like run marathons. And it also provides us with building blocks that we can use to grow. So when we eat an apple, we're not really using the apple. We're digesting it and breaking it into smaller and smaller pieces so that we can get down to those fundamental building blocks like simple sugars and amino acids that we use to build protein. And as we break that apple into those fundamental building blocks, we also release energy. And so as an evolutionary biologist, we ask, oh, and so one example of something that we, is a food in milk is lactose. Lactose is a sugar, it's a disaccharide, so it's made of two individual uh, sugars, lactose and glucose. And infants, and some adults have an enzyme called lactase, which can break the sugar into smaller parts that we can use as building blocks or for energy. And for human infants, lactose provides almost half of the calories that they get from milk. But lactose isn't the only sugar that's found in milk. There's also something called oligosaccharides, which are complex sugars made of three or more individual sugar units. But unlike lactose, Humans have no enzymes that can digest this sugar and break it into simpler sugars. Yet they're the third largest component of human milk. So as an evolutionary biologist, we ask, why would a mother be evolved to produce something in her milk that an inf if milk is supposed to be food that her infant can't use for energy or for building blocks? And I'm not going to tell you the answer right now. I'm going to make you stay tuned until the second part of the talk. Um, but we can think, why might we not want to break everything in milk down? Well, one reason that, is that our bodies need more than just energy and building blocks. 
we also need protection against disease. And sugars and proteins in milk can have immune functions, but only if we don't digest them. So before we move on, I just want to summarize the first part of the talk. We've learned so far that milk is the first food for mammals, um, but milk recipes vary among species um, to provide all the nutrition that these growing infants need. But in the second part of the talk, we're going to move on and talk more about this idea that milk provides more than just nutrition. Anybody have any questions before I move on? Yes? I was wondering about um, consuming milk from other species. You see with cows that they process, process it a lot. Um, if you're in, you know, middle of nowhere, freezing your field around, could you survive eating milk or would it cause poison? So could you survive eating the, the milk of other, other animals? Um, we do it commonly with cow's milk, but could we do it with, say, if there was a seal nearby? I, I, I think that would be challenge number one. Um, so we, we've, I think something that people commonly say is that, oh, I can't drink milk, I'm lactose intolerant. So we know that cows aren't the only species that we have domesticated for milk production. We know that we also get milk from goats and sheep and camels. And so we're, um, humans have a long tradition of, of drinking more milk than, than just cow's milk. Um, it's likely that you could probably survive on seal's milk if there wasn't much else around. Um, but as you say, probably one of the reasons that we haven't done that habitually is how would you milk a seal? <laughs> What about these, you know, maybe you'll talk about this later on, you know, when you get into the you know, um, molecules, you know, break down, but what about getting that content from other animals? Uh, like, you know, what, in cow's milk, are there the same kinds of things that are supposedly in human milk that are trying to, you know, bring up development? So, in cow's milk, are there the same kinds of things that are in yes. human milk? Um, yes and no. So, some uh, cow's milk also contains lactose. But the oligosaccharides that I mentioned appear to be special to humans. And so cows have them, but they have different kinds. And so we might not, from cow's milk or other animal milk, um, it's not an exact replicate of what, we're, of what human milk is. As I said, the recipe varies. Yes? Uh, the fact that we, as humans, have such a high content of water implies what type of environment we all come from. And is that does the, does the fact that humans have a high water content mean that, imply anything about the environment that we evolved in? Um, and does this apply to other species? So there's, there can be more than one pressure pulling at the composition of milk. So it might tell us something about the environment that we involved in, evolved in, but we can also think about how, how long do humans nurse? It can be months or even years. And so if we had a very high fat, low water milk, mom would probably deplete her fat reserves very quickly and likely wouldn't be able to keep up just by eating or would have to eat enormous amounts in order to keep up with that level of milk production. And so there's also dynamics um, and pressures pulling on that, on the composition of milk from how frequently the infant nurses, how uh, prepared the infant's digestive system is to handle a lot of fat or a lot of protein. Um, so I think we could say that it's one possibility, but there might be other competing demands. Yeah. How do infants generate lactase? How do infants generate lactase? All mammalian infants express the lactase gene um, to, up to the time that they're, they're typically done being weaned. So this is going to vary greatly, you know, in seals who nurse for four days versus humans who nurse for one, two, three or more years. So it's, it, what, is, what is more remarkable about the fact that humans are able to digest, uh, human adults can drink milk, is that we're able to still, uh, to, to still express that lactase gene rather than that we're able to express it at all. Yeah, one last question. 
how does the water content compare in cow's milk versus human's milk? Like, is it the same breakdown of the temperature? Or something? That's a good question. I don't know numbers exactly. Um, I think it, it's... But it's very dilute. It, it, yeah, it, it's roughly comparable. Uh, how would you decide if one species could substitute milk for another right. species? My guess is that it would be based on a very in-depth knowledge of what that species needs. Um, so the, there, there is lots of information about what the basic breakdown of these um, kind of macromolecules, the fats, the proteins, the sugars are in a lot of species. Um, but you would have to know about the infant, uh, the mom that you wanted to, to get milk from and the infant that you wanted to give it to. Um, so I, th I don't know exactly how you would do that. I think we'll move on and then we can take more questions at the next meeting. Here we go. Okay. Now I'm back to seeing what you're seeing. Excellent. Um, so I told you at the end of the last section that our bodies need protection from disease and that milk can be a support for the developing immune system. But one question that this might lead us to have is why do infants need immune support? Well, we tend to think that it's pretty dangerous to be a baby. <laughs> We put warning labels on our to on toys, and we put safety caps on our medicine bottles. Um, but a lot of these things are hazards because baby ears are very eager to explore their new world, but don't always know what to do with many things they find inside of it. If I gave a seven-month-old a toy, what do you think he would do with it? Yeah. Put it in his mouth. Exactly. Babies tend to explore the world in ways that exp uh, expose their developing immune system to a lot of potential germs. And just like babies don't always know what to do with objects in their world, their immune systems are naive and don't always know what to do with the germs they find either. So if we take a step back and ask, what does the immune system do? It has two main jobs. The first is that it recognizes potential dangers in our environment. like viruses, bacteria, parasites, all of these things that we generally call germs and that our moms have warned us to wash our hands for for as long as we've been alive. And the second job is to prevent, is once the, the immune system identifies these potential dangers, is to prevent these germs from causing disease or infection. And how does the immune system do this? Well, we can think of the immune system as breaking down into two basic branches, innate and adaptive immunity. So innate immunity is nonspecific. It's our first line of defense against pathogens, and it has no memory. Whereas adaptive immunity is specific, but it requires time to respond. It's not, it's not as fast as innate immunity but it can form memories so that at each time you're exposed to a pathogen, it responds a little faster. And probably the easiest way to see how this works is to act as if we've introduced a pathogen into your body and see how would the immune system respond. The innate immune system would say, this is a virus. Doesn't matter what kind of virus, just that it's a virus. And it would take a step in order to get rid of that virus as quickly as possible. So it might do something broad, like destroy infected cells and prevent the virus from replicating. And it doesn't matter if it's seen this virus before or if it's going to see it again. Uh, the, the immune response will tend to be um, the same and take the same amount of time. Whereas the adaptive immune system will look at this, uh, will, will identify this virus, not just as any old virus, but maybe in this case, specifically as the chicken pox virus. And will make specific immune molecules in order to fight that virus off, like antibodies. And we'll talk a little bit more about antibodies on the next slide. 
And the adaptive immune system does have memory. So if it's seen this pathogen before, then it might have a previous, uh, then it might have a faster response than if it hadn't. So antibodies are one of the adaptive immune proteins that can be made in response to a germ. So how are they made? So if a bacteria enters your body, it activates many parts of the innate and adaptive immune systems, including antibody-producing cells. But there are many antibody-producing cells in the body, and not all of them can make the antibody that would fight off the germ. So it could take several days for the right cell to be activated, to make more copies, and to produce enough antibodies to uh, mount an effective immune defense. And in this process, it also generates the memory cells. And if your body were to run into this bacteria again, then these memory cells would be able to uh, generate those antibodies without having to go through that selection process again. So now that we know what an immune system is supposed to do, how do we get one? Well, the immune system actually starts developing before birth. During pregnancy, antibodies are passed from the mom to the baby across the placenta. But at birth, those are a lot of the infant's immune de defenses. Um, even though almost all the pieces are in place for the infant's immune system to start growing, the infant's immune system is what we call naive. It doesn't quite, uh, so the immune system requires exposure to the outside world in order to learn what is dangerous and what is not. And so, um, in order to, in order to protect the, to help protect the infant in between this time when its immune system still doesn't know a lot about the world and this time when it, immune, uh, when it has a fully functioning immune system, we can look, for t look to support for milk. And how can milk help? Well, the immune system needs to, le needs to learn to recognize danger. And even when it starts to be able to recognize danger, the infant's immune system can't produce defenses very quickly. However, mom's immune system has already been exposed to many germs. And so milk can help deliver ready immune defenders, which take care of germs before they become a problem. For example, milk contains innate immune proteins, like lactoferrin. Now, in addition to lactoferrin, uh, so, and lactoferrin prevents bacterial growth, because milk contains iron. And iron is an essential mineral for infants to grow. But it's also really important for some bacteria. And if there's free iron floating around in the milk, the bacteria will see this as, and can take advantage of this as substrate for their own growth. But lactoferrin binds the iron so that it's not available for bacteria to grow. Lactoferrin can also directly bind to bacteria and interfere with their cell walls, um, and kill it, which kills them directly. However, in order for lactoferrin to be active and do these things, it can't be digested into these building blocks. And so scientists wanted to see, is lactoferrin active? And they decided that the easiest way to find out was to look in the diapers of breastfed infants. <laughs> and so they took poop samples, and they actually found uh, small percentages of, of lactoferrin in the poop, undigested, which means that that lactoferrin is able to travel through the entire digestive system whole and acting and protecting the infant's immune system. And just to point, uh, just to kind of drive home this point um, that innate immune proteins can work in many ways, uh, lactoferrin is also found in tears and saliva. So milk also contains adaptive immune proteins, um, such as antibodies. And there are many different kinds of antibodies, such as secretory IgA, IgG, and IgM. And these different forms of antibodies have different roles in the body. Um, secretory IgA is the one we'll focus on most, um, because that's the most common one in milk. It makes up almost 90% of the antibodies that are found in milk. It's also important for defending mucosal surfaces, like the mouth, lungs, and digestive system. And this is important because this is where the major infections that cause death in children under five occur. For example, diarrhea, 
and pneumonia. So milk is able to provide protection where infants' immune systems need the most help. So how are these milk antibodies protecting? First, they can bind to germs or pathogens by coating the outside so that they're unable to uh, invade infants' tissues like the digestive system or the lungs. They can also flag germs for destruction by other immune cells. But these are short-term kind of immediate protections. And one of the big questions that researchers have had is, can these milk antibodies have lasting effects? And so just in the past couple of months, there was a study that was published in mice. And they had, uh, these researchers had two groups of mice. They had some mice that could produce these antibodies in their milk and others that couldn't. And so they allowed these, these mice to have pups. Um, and they, they followed these pups as they grew up. And they found that the pups that had, that had milk with antibodies had healthy guts when they grew up. But the, the mice that didn't get antibodies uh, when they were nursing had guts that looked like patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And inflammatory bowel disease is a, a chronic inflammation of, this, of the large intestine, um, which can be very painful um, and can even affect how you get nutrition um, because the inside of the gut um, is so inflamed it, it can't digest properly. And so this suggests that, at least in mice, these antibodies might have long-lasting effects. Now, this is very new research and needs more attention, um, but it's an interesting first step. But what we do know is that there's more than these innate and adaptive immune proteins in milk. Remember the human milk oligosaccharides that I talked about in the first portion? Um, the complex sugars that can't be digested by humans? Well, just because they're not food for the human infant doesn't mean they're not food for something in our body. They can be digested by the bacteria in our guts. And more and more research, <laughs> <laughs> sneak peek, uh, more and more research is suggesting that the microbes in and on our body especially our gut microbes, are really important for understanding our health. And I'm not really going to talk a lot more about this today, um, but if you're interested in this topic, in two weeks on May 7th, Chris Garris will be giving a lecture on In the Loop with Poop, where this is all he talks about. <laughs> so in addition to being food for our gut microbiome, um, HMOs can also be pathogen decoys. The insides of our intestines are decorated with these complex sugars. And germs can bind to these sugars um, and use this as a way to attach to our body and potentially cause infection. There's also very, uh, these human milk oligosaccharides also have very similar structures to these sugars that are attached to our intestine. And so if germs bind to these free floating sugars, they just ride through the digestive tract and end up in dirty diapers instead of causing infection. Now there's still a lot of research to be done on this topic because we still know relatively little about what these sugars look like and what they do, but public health researchers have started to investigate this. So in one study in Mexico, uh, doctors looked at uh, a population of mothers and they looked at just one type of these sugars in their milk and they found that the women made different amounts of this sugar and they grouped them as low, intermediate, and high. So if they, were, um, if they were high, they made a lot of this sugar. And they followed them over several months to see if, inf uh, if infants would de develop diarrhea. And what they found was that over the course of the study, infants whose mothers made milk with a lot of, these, uh, of this one kind of sugar had less diarrhea than infants whose mothers didn't make this which suggests that HMOs are an important form of immune protection in milk. Um, but there's still a lot of research to be done. So in summary, we, we know that being a baby can be dangerous um, because infants often explore their worlds in ways that ex expose them to a lot of microbes. Um, but milk defenses can help protect the infant while its immune system develops. And lactoferrin antibodies and HMOs are just a few examples of these milk defenses. Yes. Is that, like, are the HMOs probiotic because they feed the bacteria? 
So HMOs are, uh, so um, the question is, are HMOs probiotics because they feed the bacteria? They're actually prebiotics. So probiotics is when you're taking active bacteria and adding them to your, your microbial colonies. Prebiotics is when you're adding something that feeds those, the, the, uh, the microbes that you already have. So yes, they would be considered prebiotics. Yes? Um, so it seems like within the same species of the human mother, mm -hmm. there's slight variation in the formula of the milk produced. Do, do we know that that is genetically or nutritionally? So actually, uh, so the question is it seems like there's slight variation uh, or there could be slight variation in the milk that mothers make. And is this genetically based or is it nutritionally based? Um, so actually, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the last part of the talk. Um, but the answer is that it seems to be some of both. Um, but really, this is a highly unexplored area. A lot of the milk research that's been done has been done in, in, uh, in hospitals in places like Boston. Um, so we don't have a good idea of what does the milk all over the world look like. Yeah. Okay, so how long is it uh, before a baby's own immune system uh, fully takes over? And I'm wondering if this kind of thing is maybe being looked at uh, for uh, people with uh, immune disorders. Uh, so um, how long does it take an infant's immune system to fully develop? And are these things being looked at as treatments for people with immune disorders? I'm going to hit uh, that last part in, this, in the last part of the talk. Um, and I'd be happy to talk more about that later. Um, and the, the first part of your question? The first part is, you know, when, how long is it how long? the immune system fully takes over? Uh, how long so do you need mother's milk? Right? How long? So there, there's, no, there's, there's no one answer for how long um, does, it, does the infant's immune system take to develop, because different parts develop at different rates. So some parts develop very early and are almost fully functional within the first month. Um, but other, but to, to really have a full immune function um, might take five years or more. So, to, because if you, uh, the immune system requires exposure to the outside world and, and the, uh, in order to be fully mature. So that just takes time. Formula fit? Uh huh. Do formula fed babies just get sick more? That's a tough question to answer um, because not. There were a lot of studies in the first part of the 20th century that found that formula fed infants just got sick more. But I'm going to talk a little bit more later in the talk about how formula has changed since then. Also, how much sanitation has changed. After the invention of the refrigerator, formula fed babies got sick a lot less. So um, there, there's no one answer to do formula fed babies just get sick more. Yes? I'm just curious, but how do you put error bars on the number of cases of diarrhea? Or is that like average, like the common reading? This was many, many mothers. In e yeah, in each category. This was no, this was not three mothers. Yes. How long do antibodies actually last? Like in the mother. How long do the antibodies last inside the infant after they're transferred from the mother? The antibodies that are transferred across across the placenta, or the antibodies in milk. Uh, the antibodies that are transferred across the placenta can last several months, I think. But the antibodies that are transferred in milk, that depends on how long they can stay in the digestive tract. So I don't know how, how frequently infants make bowel movements, but you can probably estimate based on that. Do, do the antibodies get absorbed? In humans, we don't have good evidence that those antibodies get absorbed. In cows, um, they actually don't have antibodies that get transferred across the placenta during pregnancy. Um, but actually, they uh, so the first day or so of cow's milk is 
full of, uh, of these antibodies that are then taken up by the infant's immune system, um, or by the, by the calf's immune system. Um, so the, the calf really doesn't digest anything for the first several hours after it's born. And so humans also have colostrum, right? So is there a similar function for human colostrum? Is there so colostrum is the first is the milk that comes in for the first 48 to uh, 48 hours to four days after birth, and it's different than the milk that we've been talking about so far because it's it's very rich in immunoproteins, and there's evidence that this is this is good for for helping establish a healthy gut microbiome for putting a lot of these protections in the infant right away, but whether or not the infant is actually taking these from the digestive tract into circulation, the evidence for that isn't really good. We'll do one more question. Or we'll take a short intermission. <laughs> and we'll see you back in So we'll take about a 10 minute break. Minutes. And um, during which, if you just pick up a survey or a handout outside, please do so. Uh, we love to get feedback on what we can improve in our lectures. So please fill out the survey.
turn my microphones back on. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. So during the break, we had a question come in from one of our viewers online, um, referring back to this slide, asking, do we know why some mothers make more HMOs than others? Well, for this specific type of HMO that they were looking for, uh, we know that this one happens to be genetically controlled. Um, and so they're, so HMOs are complex sugars that are made of more than one uh, simple sugar. Um, and so to put these simple sugars together, we need enzymes, just like we need enzymes to break them apart. And so genes, uh, if you don't have genes for certain enzymes, you or if you don't have alleles that code for genes with certain enzymes so you can't make those enzymes, then you can't make specific types of HMOs or you can't make as many of them. Um, so it, it seems that at least some of these are, are genetically controlled that determines how many and what kind we can make. Yes? Within a species. This is all humans. So now we'll move on to the last part of our talk. Um, thinking about new questions in milk research and applications for milk as medicine. So, so far we've focused on the infant's immune system and how it grows and develops through exposure to uh, its environment in early life. But the mother was once a baby herself and her experiences shaped the development of her immune system. And those experiences likely shaped what ended up in her milk. And we know that these experiences are probably different for different women because not all of the diseases that we see, uh, we don't see all of the same diseases everywhere in the world. We also know that people have different lifestyles and different diets. So should we expect the immune molecules in milk to be the same around the globe? Well, this is the, this is the question that my research project is trying to answer. So I'm interested in collecting milk from around the world and comparing the composition of the milk to environment and diet. So collecting milk from all around the world is kind of an ambitious project. Um, <laughs> so I'm starting with a couple of places at a time. Uh, and one of those is right here in Boston. So last summer I invited moms to come into our lab uh, right next door at the Peabody Museum and give me milk samples and talk a little bit about their childhood, their adulthood, if they'd been ill recently, um, all these things that we might expect might tell us something about the immune molecules in their milk. Now, I also um, head over to Poland um, and work at, at a rural farming village at the Mogolika Human Ecology Study Site. And so, one of the questions that I, I get asked is, well, you're hundreds of thousands of miles away from your, your lab at that point, so how do you collect milk outside of a lab? Well, it starts with loading up a suitcase with everything that you might need uh, to collect milk, not leaving a lot of room for your clothes. Um, and then once I get to Poland, I spend a lot of time walking around and just asking people, do you know of any moms in the area who might be interested in participating in my study? And then very similar to what we do in Boston, we talk to them about their lives. It's a farming village, so we ask, did you live on a farm growing up? What kind of animals uh, do you have right now? Did you have as a child? Have you been sick recently? Um, and we also collect milk samples. And we weigh the babies uh, before and after. This is me weighing a baby. Um, so that we can, they breastfeed to try and estimate how much milk they're eating. And so why these places? Well, they have very different lifestyles. Here in Boston, we're surrounded by lots of other people. And we often don't see any animals except our pets. But in this area in Poland, most people are farmers, and people see chickens, cows, and horses every day. This is my field assistant, Anya, mm -hmm. talking to a cow that we ran across on, uh, that we ran up, uh, ran into on the road. So that would never happen here in Boston. So we're going to these places because we want to know, does the environment matter? for what is in milk? If so, why? Is it, the diet to ex is it the diet? Is it exposure to other people? Or is it exposure to animals? And we don't have any answers to these questions yet, but we're going into the lab to find them. Um, and new technologies make this a really exciting time to be in re uh, milk research. So proteomics is the large-scale study of, of proteins. 
And it's been a really quickly growing area of research lately. And one of the questions that researchers who are doing proteomics and interested in milk ask are, what are the proteins in milk that we didn't know about before? How can we measure many of them at once? Um, and this gives us leaps and bounds forward in understanding what's in milk. And as we start to understand what's in milk, we can start to develop medical applications for it. So now we're going to talk about milk as medicine. So we talked earlier about milk antibodies and how they're transferred across the placenta uh, or, and how some antibodies are transferred across the placenta during the last uh, trimester of pregnancy in order to help protect the infant soon after it's born. Well, premature babies miss out on some of that third trimester. So they receive fewer antibodies from mom during pregnancy. And this puts them at higher risk for infections such as necrolyzing enterco enterocolitis, which sounds really scary. Um, and it is. Because necrolyzing means tissue death. Entero and col refer to the small and large intestine. And itis is inflammation. And so what you should take away from this is this is a really bad gut disease. And it can have, and it's rare, and it can be successfully treated in many cases, but it can also have side, uh, side infections and even cause death. So clinicians and doctors are looking for ways that we can prevent infants from getting these diseases so we don't have to worry about curing them. And breast milk might actually help prevent these diseases, uh, neck from even occurring. So doctors looked at, a popul uh, at premature infants that were in the neonatal ICU. And they uh, took infants and they looked at infants that, had, that ate different amounts of breast milk during their stay in the neonatal ICU. So everything from infants who didn't have any breast milk at all to infants that all they ate was breast milk. And they looked over the first three months in their stay in the neonatal ICU to see how many ended up developing these neck infections. And they found that the more milk that an infant consumed, the less, uh, the fewer infants in that group that ended up developing neck. And so this suggests that breast milk might prevent the disease. And many hospitals are now encouraging breast milk for premature infants. But milk might be medicine for more than just babies. Do you remember the, the mice that we saw earlier um, that had, where we looked at mice that did and did not receive uh, antibodies when they were uh, in milk? The researchers of the, who did that experiment wanted to try something else. They wanted to see if this, uh, if antibodies mattered throughout your life. So we know that uh, adult immune systems are making antibodies all the time. And so they took two populations of mice, both of which received antibodies when they were, when they were small through milk. And then some of these mice could produce those antibodies when they were adult. And some of them couldn't. And this bottom condition is, looks a lot like what happens um, in people who have inflammatory bowel disease and other related conditions. They're not able to continue to produce as many antibodies early in life. And they fed both of these groups water that had uh, a chemical in it that could cause damage to the intestine. And they looked and they saw that mice who were still, uh, who could produce antibodies had, were better able to repair the damage caused by this water than the mice that didn't have the antibodies. So to them, this suggested that antibodies are important in the gut throughout life. But one way that we could think about treating this is by isolating antibodies from milk and then reintroducing them uh, and then feeding them to an adult in a purified form. And by replacing these antibodies, we might be able to see some of these uh, better repair um, and healthier guts um, as treatment for disease. So there have also been some surprising discoveries about milk. So in 1995, some Swedish researchers wanted to know if milk would prevent bacteria from sticking to cells. And so they decided to test this in, in two populations of cells. They had some normal skin cells 
and some tumor cells. And they added bacteria, and then they added milk to see if this would prevent the bacteria from sticking to the cells. But what they were really surprised to see was that the milk actually killed some of the tumor cells. But it was not harming the normal cells. And so sometime after that, they identified this, mil this milk molecule that was killing tumor cells. And they found that it was a combination of a protein, alpha-lactalbumin, and a fat, oleic acid, that had combined. And they called it Hamlet. Human alpha-lactalbumin made lethal to tumor cells. <laughs> and so Hamlet works <laughs> by entering tumor cells, uh, by entering bacterial and tumor cells, and damaging their DNA. And so it actually damages the DNA so much uh, that the cell can't survive and commits suicide which just goes to show you that when Hamlet's involved, the end is usually tragic. Um, and happy birthday, Shakespeare, today. It is Shakespeare's birthday today. I think he's 450. Is that right? Yeah. So maybe something that's tragic for bacterial cells can actually be good for us. The next question that researchers wanted to know is, can Hamlet kill tumor cells outside the Petri dish? And so they choose to, chose to look at this in, uh, hu with human skin papillomas. These are fairly common, um, but they're benign or premalignant, so they're not cancerous tumor cells. But the current treatments uh, include, the current ways to treat human skin papillomas include cutting them off or freezing them, uh, things that can also destroy healthy tissue. So they recruited people who had skin papillomas and they asked them to either apply a Hamlet solution or salt water every day for three weeks. And at the end of three weeks, they found that the tumor cells actually started, that the tumors actually started shrinking. And that these effects lasted for up to two years. Um, the, so the papillomas didn't grow back and they didn't report any negative side effects of applying the Hamlet solution. So, this might be one potential therapy um, for, for treating at least surface tumors. But what's a tumor killing molecule doing in milk? That's definitely not food. Um, well, during infancy, the gut is growing rapidly, and that means that cells are dividing many, many times, which creates opportunities for error. So Hamlet might regulate cells that divide too much um, before they become tumors. But where does all this, where, uh, so we've now seen three ways that human milk could be used as medicine. With premature infants in preventing a gut infection, antibodies um, potentially as a therapy for inflammatory gut diseases in adults, um, and Hamlet and cancer cells. But where does milk for these treatments come from? If you're a premature infant, you might be able to get your milk from your mom. But one of the issues with giving milk to premature infants is that the third trimester is not only important for getting antibodies from mom into the baby, it's also really important for breast development and preparing for lactation. So if infants are born too early, um, moms might have problems lactating um, and might not be able to, pr uh, to provide milk for their infants. So one option is milk banks. And there are several milk banks uh, around the country, including one in Upper in Newton Upper Falls, Massachusetts. Um, there, could, are, there are also probably some milk banks that are associated with hospitals and not on this map. Um, but compare this to the number of blood banks in the country. So the bottom line here is that the milk supply is not unlimited. So because of this, some families look to the internet to get milk for their infants. And so Yep. Just last year, um, some researchers purchased milk online as if they were families. And they collected uh, comparative samples from milk banks and tested both sets for bacteria that could potentially cause infections. And they found that for every type of bacteria they tested for, there was more of that bacteria in the, in the milk from the internet than from the milk bank. Um, so, because currently, 
milk that you can purchase on the internet isn't regulated. So there's no one standardizing how you store it or ship it. Um, so until we can get those measures in place uh, to make sure that milk is safe, we need other options. And one of the immediate ap applications of doing milk research is improving formula. So before formula, animals' milk, such as cow's milk, was used as a breast milk replacement. But the first chemist to look at breast milk in 1760 um, found that it wasn't the same as cow's milk. But it took another 100 years before someone patented the first infant food, which was designed to look chemically more like human milk than cow's milk. And so after the, f after the first infant food, there was an explosion of different brands. And you could have a choice of over 30 brands by the time we got to the early 1900s. Um, and in 1915, Nestle was advertising that their infant food was so nearly like mother's milk. Today, we realize they were still missing vitamins, minerals, protein. And there have been a lot of improvements since then to regulate how we produce uh, how we produce formula and what goes into it. So today we know that you have to have certain levels of protein, fats, vitamins, and minerals, um, or you, the products can't be labeled as infant formula. But there are still many ways that we can improve formula um, and that people are, are looking to add some of these biological and bioactive factors back into it. So one thing that people have been looking into recently is growing immune proteins in plants that can then be added to formula. So they'll take DNA that encodes how to, um, how to make a milk protein like lactoferrin, put it in something like rice, and then be able to harvest these proteins out afterwards to add back. People are also looking into adding HMOs as prebiotics to grow healthy gut microbes. Um, but the HMOs that humans, uh, the, the milk oligosaccharides that humans make are much more complex than a lot of other species. So we can't just pull them from cows or another. Uh, we'll ha right now, we have to synthesize them, uh, which is very expensive. So it's not yet feasible uh, for us to mass produce these. But people are trying to figure out how it could be. Because feeding the gut microbiota might be important for our health, which you'll find out more about if you come to the next Science in the News lecture. <laughs> So in summary, uh, new technologies are letting us learn a lot more about milk than we ever knew before. Um, and milk may be able to help prevent and treat diseases in the future. Um, but there are also ways that we can use milk research right now um, to help improve the, the technologies that we already have. And what I hope you've learned tonight is that milk is the first food that mammals consume, but milk is more than food. Milk, milk helps pr protect against germs while the infant's own immune system develops. And in the future, we may be able to use milk's natural properties for a wide variety of medical applications. So I'd like to thank you all for coming and thank our sponsors. And I'm happy to take any questions right now. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, it looks, it looks like you've got that on a log scale. You know, so it's yes. Like, you know, what's the significance of baseline uh, there? Do you understand what I'm saying? Or right. Depending on where you put the baseline, that means there's a big difference or a small difference. Right. What's an acceptable level of bacteria right. in milk? Right. Um, so we know that milk actually has bacteria from the mother. But it's probably not going to be um, some of these things like staph or strep. Um, I don't know exactly where we would set the baseline, but I also know that the milk, the the milk bank milk, would be pasteurized before it's given to infants. So it's likely that these numbers for the milk bank would even drop. Yeah. Um, I was at a lecture that Nancy Morbacher gave a few weeks ago about milk sharing. And she addressed this study. Um, where one of the things that she said was actually that some of the methodology was a little bit cheaply, and that um, some of the milk had like been shipped ground, and so it had been out of refrigeration for up to five days, and that um, in, 
basically her point was that um, there are there may be ways to reduce this without um, without necessarily totally restricting either mother to mother self sharing. Exactly. This is this is not to say that milk sharing is, is not a good thing, just that regulations are um, without regulations on average. Yes. Do you know how the Hamlet molecule attacks the first kill the single cell to the second cell? Like why does it like why how does it identify tumor cells? I believe um, I believe that it is known, but I do not know specifically. Uh, absolutely, pasteurization um, can kill, some, can destroy some of the proteins and, and molecules in milk. So doesn't that defeat some of the purpose of um, sharing for to get the immune proteins? It, it's entirely possible. Um, it likely does, but there's the trade-off between killing the bad things and keeping the good. But could you say a So we know that pasteurization can denature some of them, but pasteurization, it, it depends on to what temperature you go. So for many of these proteins, we know at what point they'll start to denature and no longer become active. But that, that point isn't the same for all proteins. And so you could um, change your pasteurization process to take it into account that, but I don't know if anyone is looking to how can we pasteurize um, in order to save these things, but get rid of these. Yes. Um, when you talk about the, um, you were touching on the, um, on the cells that were, that were cancer and cancer. Mm -hmm. That was, um, that was milk from a milk bank, right? I don't know where that milk was coming from. But it was human milk. Have, have similar tests been done to say cow milk? So that was a purified protein from human milk. It was not human milk directly, right? So, um, so they have identified that there is a an equivalent of this protein in cows. They call it Bamlet. <laughs> and so there, there. Um, I believe that people have investigated to see if it would have similar functions, um, but I don't know exactly. Yes. How uh, how exactly lactoferrin is harvested from rice? You know that's a great question, and I don't know exactly how they do it. Uh, I know that they can do it, and I know that they have successfully put it in infant formulas, but I don't know how they get it out. Yes. So, so far, I haven't been investigating cultures that use milk as medicine. I've had plenty of people come up to me and tell me that they've used milk to treat um, various things, um, but I, I haven't been formally studying it. I have ex so do I have any preliminary results on the on the research that I'm doing in Poland versus Boston? I have very very preliminary results, um, and it looks like there might be some differences, but I I can't yet address the magnitude of those differences because um, I have to control for some things like mother's age and how old the infant is um, before I can say anything definitively. But I'd be happy to talk to you more about that after. Thank you all for coming.